call and rescue. No, there are 80,000 999 calls made every day. Hello, what's the problem? It's the police. Uh, can I have a police? I uh, stole my money. Who stole your money? Some are more serious than others. Yeah, he's not breathing. Like, boy, flat his back for me now. I laid him flat on his back. On rare occasions, the call is to report a death. Emergency service. I've run over my wife who's been feeding the cows and one of the cows must have knocked. Some people broke into our house. Okay, okay. Who all his money? Okay, Tim. <laughs> But what if the caller she's not <laughs> right, she's not moving at all. is, in fact, a killer? Someone being stabbed, I think they did. Melsonby is a pretty village in one of the most rural parts of North Yorkshire. At the heart of Melsonby Village is the post office and village shop, located on the busy crossroads. The post office was owned and run by Robin Garbutt and his wife, Diana. Robin was up very early. He opened at five o'clock every day and ran what people described as a very good post office business. Thank you very much. I got to know him virtually most mornings, uh, delivering the milk to the shop. Morning, Dave. How are you? Fine, thanks. Just... See him six days a week, every morning at about the same time, only for about ten minutes, quarter of an hour. But we'd always have a little little chat. Just pop it there. I'll see to it in a minute. Right out. See ya. Take care. He was very easy to talk to. No airs and graces about him. Always clean shaven. Always smartly dressed. A dapper gent. <laughs> All right. I'll just put the kettle on. Do you want one? They were a big part of the village. Diane belonged to a book club. We'd get together at least maybe in the summer, maybe twice a month. And then we became friends and they became part of our circle of friends. It was really um, a very relaxed time. Di was very popular. Everybody loved Di. She was a friendly person. She would sit and talk to anybody. Diane didn't spend a great deal of time in the shop. She used to come in on a night time and sit on a stool near the post office part and uh, talk to people and uh, chat away. The work of a postmaster is never done. They bought it as a business with a shop. The original intention had been that Diana would do the post office and Robin was going to look after the shop. That was how they envisaged it at the outset. I think what happened after a while was that Diana kind of lost interest in that. OK, I'll catch you later. But that was counted for by Robin's increasing interest in the whole thing. He found he loved it, so he sort of more or less had taken over over everything. How does that sound? Perfect. Pub? I'd love to. The duty calls in the morning. Oh, come on. Shop can wait. Oh, do you want to get up at four? His social life was somewhat stymied by the fact that he went to bed at nine o'clock in the evenings because he was getting up so early. She didn't get up as early. You know, she... She'd often stay in bed till 11 o'clock because, you know, that was her lifestyle. Diane would come here and Robin would have to be up for the papers about 4 o'clock in the morning and he might go home and Diane would stay because she didn't get up as early. So she would stay, have a drink with us and, you know, and that's how we were. Robin and Diana met seven or eight years earlier. Robin had been working in the electrical supply industry. Diana had actually been in the army for a while, and then she was working at prison, Full Sutton, as a prison guard. 
But then they decided to get married and, and to buy this business. Robin and I were happy. I never heard her say anything bad about him or him to her. I think they were both outgoing and, and had fairly extrovert personalities. Um, this tended to manifest itself in different ways. Nevertheless, there was, there was nothing to indicate that, that, that there was any rift between them. On the morning of the 17th of March, 2009, Robin Garbutt was following his usual routine by preparing the shop for the morning rush hour. Get up. Fill up the safe. A masked intruder crept into the shop and held Robin at gunpoint. Get away, Rob. With a pistol aimed at his head, Robin was forced to empty the post office safe. With the intruder gone, Robin immediately called 999. Police, please. It's the post office. Melson me. We've been robbed. In the rural Yorkshire village of Melsonby, the village post office owned by Robin and Diana Garbutt had been robbed at gunpoint. Don't say a word. Get out. Police, please. It's, it's the post office. Melson me. We've been robbed. 11,000 had been taken. We've just gone. They'd been wearing balaclavas, you know, you'd got no identification, basically. Despite the follow-up police investigation, no one was apprehended for the robbery, and life continued as normal for Robin and Diana. Afterwards, he was a wreck in that shop. He was, he was absolutely scared, totally. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not a one-off case. Um, there were other post offices that had been done in a similar way um, in the area. The village is quite close to the A1, and it's not unheard of for small rural post offices to be to be targeted uh, by by armed robbers um, because they obviously are viewed as, as soft targets. There was a parish notice board outside the post office, and Robin had said after the first robbery, "I want that notice board moved because I can't monitor what is happening." outside the shop while that is there. And the parish council agreed and they did move the, the notice board. After the robbery, Robin asked the post office to pay him more for security, but the post office refused. He had contemplated putting in his own security system, but Diana had other ideas. I really think we should update the kitchen, don't you? Why? What's wrong with it? It's only 100 years out of date. You know we can't afford it. Oh, come on. It won't cost that much. I am serious. We can't afford it. Robin? But keen to keep his wife happy, the couple chose a new kitchen over a new security system for the post office. Diane was more outspoken than Robin. Robin was very quiet and uh, totally different. You know, if Diane didn't like something, a spade was a spade. And Diane wasn't one of these people who talked behind your back. She said it to your face. This is a real big family village. It's that friendly a village that you don't feel uncomfortable if you want to go out and have a drink and socialise. And so it wasn't unusual that uh, Robin and I go out individually or they'd go out like we did as a couple. And so we got together very regular. 
new. What do you think? Expensive. So, oh, early birthday present. Every girl needs spoiling once in a while, Robbie. <laughs> Sometimes they would, you know, um, Diane would be in the pub and I hadn't gone round, but maybe some other friends have. They were happy to shut the shop up, come round to somebody's house in the village and have a barbecue, a chat and a drink. Well, it was lovely to see you all. Well, Robin, you're not going now, are you? It's been a few hours. Oh, Robin, come on, please. Just another one. <laughs> Come on, darling, just open up a bit later. If only. Well, I'm staying. I'll see you a bit later. Right. Well, it's nice to see you both. Bye, darling, I shall see you in the morning. Good night. 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 I'll shop and no sex, that one. <laughs> I think everybody regarded them as a couple. That isn't to say that they were regarded as a perfect couple. Robin. Oh, Robin. Oh, come on, wake up. Certainly, uh, Diana had remarked that Robin was all shop and no sex. But nevertheless, there was, there was nothing to indicate that, that, that there was any rift between them. But life after the robbery was becoming more difficult for the couple, as Robin put more time and effort into the business than his marriage. What's wrong? I'm fine. What's the matter? Nothing. Die? I'm bored, Robin. I'm bored of it all. I just, I'm bored of the post office. I'm bored of this life. I'm bored of this marriage. What? It was our dream. Our business. Oh, it's hard work, but I thought you wanted it. I did. Just not anymore. What are you saying? I don't want to be stuck in here forever. You know, doing the same thing day in, day out. There's more to life than running a post office. Hi. You're going to leave me, are you? We'll get away from it. Really? Robin's promise of a holiday appeared to placate Diana, and life continued for the couple. Hi, I'm back. Did you get everything okay? Bank called, said the card was overdrawn. Oh, it's all sorted. I'm just unloading now. Hey, what do you fancy for tea? Uh, fish and chips. Tell you what, I'll just finish this lot off and I'll head out to the chippy, eh? On March the 22nd, 2010, Robin Garbutt went out to buy fish and chips for himself and Diana. Can't wait till we go away. Three whole weeks. The American dream. They were going to America to see Di's sister. It was going to be a real treat for them, and, uh, and they'd arranged to renew their wedding vows in Las Vegas. You want to watch yourself in Vegas, all those casinos. Yeah, <laughs> and all those free cocktails. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I'm so looking forward to it. I don't think trips to America were a regular occurrence. I think they'd specifically saved up for this one, and it was going to be a real treat for them. That evening, the couple went to bed as normal, with Robin's alarm clock ready for a 5 a.m. start. On March the 23rd, 2010, Robin woke as usual. Washed and shaved before heading downstairs to prepare for the morning's business. Hey, 
So from five o'clock, he was very busy either serving people in the shop or unloading the rest of the material that he'd bought the night before at the cash and carry. Morning. Morning, Dave. Hey, good result for you lot at the weekend. Well, wonders never cease. <laughs> Two one, eh? Very good. <laughs> right, gotta go. Right, no rest of the wicked. On you go. See you later. Take care. Right, mate. The morning rush continued with a regular stream of customers right, well, up until approximately 8.30 a.m. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Don't move. We've got your wife. We need to turn the light off and lock the door. Whilst alone in the shop, Robin was confronted by a masked gunman. With the intruder claiming another gang member had Diana under their control. Well, look it. As the gunman left, Robin immediately went upstairs to check on his wife, Diana. Die. 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 Oh my God. Horrified by the sight of Diana's blood-soaked head, Robin immediately called 999. Ambulance, what's the address of the emergency? It's, uh, it's the car shop, two weeks old, Nelson Bay. Sorry, could you just repeat that for me? It's a really bad line. Sorry, it's the corner shop. Yep, yeah, is that it's... coming at uh, the old post office? That's it, yes. Yeah. My wife's been attacked. She's been attacked? Is the attacker still nearby? No, no, no. No, he's gone. Were any weapons involved or mentioned? The guy with me. Um, he had a gun and he said to me... He, he said, had a gun, sir. The guy who came with me said he had a... Well, he did have a gun and he said, don't be stupid, um, we've got your wife. At around 8.30 a.m., Robin Garbett's village shop was robbed by an armed gunman. Don't move. We've got your wife. Who claimed another gang member had his wife, Diana, under their control. After emptying the safe, Robin rushed upstairs to check on his wife and made a shocking discovery. Die. Oh my God. With his wife motionless and soaked in blood, Robin called 999. Ambulance, what's the address of the emergency? It's, uh, it's the corner shop, Two East Road, Nelson Bay. Sorry, could you just repeat that for me? It's a really bad line. Sorry, it's the corner shop. Yeah, is that coming at uh, the old post office? That's it, yes. Yeah. And then that's East Road? Yes. Yeah. In which town? Uh, sorry, it's Nelson Bay. The wife's been attacked. She's been attacked? Is the attacker still nearby? No, no, no. No, he's gone. He's Were gone. any weapons involved or mentioned? I think the, uh, the guy with me... Um, he had a gun and he said to me... He had a gun, sir. The guy who came with me said he had a... Well, he did have a gun and he said, Don't be stupid, um, we've got your wife. He's gone, I've come upstairs. But has your wife been shot? I don't know if he had a gun, I don't know. In a blind panic, Robin exited the flat above the shop to find help. Please help me. Dad's been attacked. God, I'll, I'll come right away. He returned moments later with a neighbour. Turn her over. Oh my God. What about her face? Shh. 
shortly after half past eight, we heard the sirens coming down the road. They just pulled up outside the post office uh, shop. Two paramedics raced up, tried the front door, but then they couldn't get in the front door, so they raced round the back. Well, they let loose, and there was the police, and sort of everybody descended on the village, and that's when we knew it was serious. The post office had been cordoned off by police, there were several police officers around, and there was a lot of activity. The news that was coming out of the shop was that, you know, there'd been a robbery and they'd been shot, because previous year there had been an armed robbery, more or less, to the, to the day. So, we, you know, we thought, oh, hell, not again, you know, and it, it, you said all things go through your mind. Immediately, the police began their investigation, forensically searching the village for clues and conducting interviews with the locals, looking for any information on who killed Diana Garbutt. When they examined uh, Diana's body on the bed, they realised that she had been struck three times. Three blows to the head and a considerable amount of blood had been shed. I was at work and I got a phone call and saying to me that um, something had happened in the shop and that Diane had been killed. I just couldn't believe it, like, you know, it was a, a terrible, terrible shock. Absolute devastation, like, that, that, that the place would never be the same again. Uh, and Robin would never be the same again. Die was his life, he worshipped her. Robin and Diana were a very popular couple, um, and, and for people to find out that Mrs. Garbutt had, had died was was a big shock. Mid morning, the, the police had, had issued a statement to say that that they had launched a murder investigation. As the investigation continued, Robin was brought into the police station for routine questioning. I'm in the post office and I heard a noise and I thought it was Di coming into the shop. There's a guy. Damn it! And I just knew that I was going to be robbed. The first thing he said to me was... We got your wife. Fill in the safe. And he just walked out. And I went straight upstairs and I put my head into Di's bedroom, our bedroom, and that's when I... Di? That's when I found that... she'd been... You know, she was proving. In the days that followed, the police continued to search the village for clues. I, I think as information came out, there was various searches done in various areas. They did the village green, they did the churchyard, the, and again, they did, you know, they did our yard. This is the main crossroads, uh, east to west, and obviously north to south. That's the motorway road there, and it's about a mile down the motorway. Um, you see the front of the shop, and then you come to the rear, and then that's where the, you know, the bar was found up on the top of this wall here. A rusty metal bar was on top of this wall. This was where the bar was found, just on this wall here. What was interesting was that everybody said it looked as though it had been placed there. Uh, this wall was eight feet high from the roadside, though if you walked around to the garage, then the ground sloped upwards, so in fact the wall was only about three feet high from that side. So when they sent it for analysis, it turned out to be the murder weapon because it had Diana's uh, DNA on it. I mean, he maybe expected it to go over, I don't know. I mean, there's two ways, isn't it? You either throw it or you would clamber up and just put it on, you know. With the yard being inaccessible during the morning of the murder, it made no sense to the police that the murderer had risked being seen by climbing the wall in full view of the road. The kids stand right opposite our wall. 27 minutes past, they're all here. It's fairly... <laughs> you can more or less set your, set your clock by it, you know. They know that it rings right with it, you know. 
With no eyewitnesses of the assailants during the busiest part of the day, the police began to doubt Robin's version of events. Very quickly, the police were skeptical of Robin's story. They had listened to what he'd said, and they didn't believe him. They didn't think that what he was saying was, was likely to have happened. Just three weeks after the murder of Diana, Robin was arrested on suspicion of her murder and taken to North Allerton Police Station for questioning. Robin was, was arrested, questioned and then charged. Robin was then refused bail and was sent to prison. Police had found a pair of bloodstained shorts, which they asserted were his and therefore, you know, he was, he was a violent man. The forensic analysis confirmed the bloodied shorts did not belong to Robin, and the iron bar discovered at the scene had none of Robin's DNA on it. He was later released on bail to await trial for the murder of his wife. The village was very split, and it was very difficult because everybody wanted an opinion, and nobody wanted to listen to an opinion, and everybody formed their own opinion. Those who weren't as close to Robin or didn't understand it became very much that uh, the village became divided at one time. People who knew him, that went in the shop on a regular basis, all stood behind him, they all said the same thing, knowing and meeting him and knowing the character of him, that he couldn't have done it. On March the 23rd, 2010, Damn it. Got your wife. Robin Garbutt's village post office was robbed at gunpoint. As the gunman left, Robin ran to check his wife in their flat above the shop. Die. Oh my God. She'd been killed with three blows to the head. As the police investigated, the murder weapon was found across the road from the post office. You know, the bar was found was on the top of this wall here. A rusty metal bar was on top of this wall. This, it turned out to be the murder weapon because it had Diana's uh, DNA on it. Very quickly, the police were skeptical of Robin's story. Three weeks after the murder of Diana, her husband Robin was charged with her murder but bailed to await his trial. Robin was asked to stay away from the village for good enough reasons and he went to live with his mother. All we were bothered about was finding out how Robin was because we knew he'd be devastated and we just wanted to show him that we supported him and we wanted to know that we believed in him. I'm so sorry, Robin. Yeah. I miss her so much. And he was very emotional and Every time he talked about Di, he cried. We're all behind you. The old village. You don't have to worry about a thing. But I'm scared. What they're going to say in court. You know I'll support you. But I have to hear it from you. Did you have anything to do with this? You shouldn't have to ask me that. I know. I'm sorry. Just over a year after the murder of Diana, Robin Garbutt's murder trial began at Teesside Crown Court. There was a, a large amount of interest, um, both from the media, there was obviously also family members. Um, both Diana's mother and, and, and Robin's family attended the court. This was an extraordinary trial and there were some extraordinary features in it. Probably the most extraordinary feature was the way in which time of death was determined. The time of death was, was absolutely crucial because if it happened after five or certainly after six, there was no way that Robin could have done it because the till roll, roll showed that he'd been completely busy in, in the shop. The prosecution's pathologist concluded from the autopsy on Diana's body that the fish and chips she'd eaten the night before was not sufficiently digested. 
the expert purported to give a time of death that allowed the police to say that the death had occurred prior to Robin starting work in the shop that morning at, at 5 a.m. Supporting the time of death calculated by the prosecution's pathologist was the testimony of Robin's neighbor he'd summoned to the scene. When the body was discovered, the neighbor said she thought the fingers were, were stiff, although she attributed that, that to all the blood um, and making the fingers difficult to move. Oh my God, a face. What about a face? She also said the body was still warm, although perhaps getting a little cold. Well, I, th I think from my point of view, it was, it was just the fact that she possibly could have died at half past three in the morning or half past two in the morning. And I was there. And she was lying dead, dead upstairs. Um, and yet he can put on this mask and performance as if nothing had happened as a cool, calculated killer. Adding to the dossier of evidence to discredit Robin's account, during his police interview, he told the investigators he'd not left his home after returning with the fish and chips. And yet a villager testified in court that she'd seen Robin acting suspiciously Robin! outside the post office on the night before the murder. This was deemed important because Robin had said he hadn't, he hadn't left the shop that evening, yet this lady was, was adamant that she had seen Robin. Added to the prosecution's case was the notion that all was not well in the Garbutt's marriage. Possibly the most shocking evidence put before the jury was the, the details of Robin and Dinah's relationship. Uh, Robin. Oh, come on, let go. Oh, shop and no sex, that one. There were suggestions that uh, Dinah, in some ways, felt a little bit lonely within the relationship because I think Robin was so tied up with the business. Mrs. Garbutt was, was particularly not happy within the relationship and was potentially looking to, to, to get out. Mrs. Garbutt had visited dating sites in the days and weeks before, before the incident. There was evidence from people who had had affairs with Mrs. Garbutt in the months and, and years before the murder. I think in one case there was a fleeting kiss, in another case uh, two of them got drunk at a party. There was evidence given that Diana had, had been packing that night, that clothes had been removed from the wardrobe. Um, there was also evidence given that they were sleeping in separate bedrooms. Um, Diana was found in, in the spare bedroom, um, not in the, in, the, in the couple's bedroom. Uh, the suggestion being that they, they were sleeping apart. On the night before Diana's murder, Robin had driven to the local cash and carry to restock the village shop. Really, I'm sorry, this, this doesn't work either. I've tried this card and your wife's card. His credit cards were declined. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. Robin had also tried to use Diana's credit card. That too was declined, prompting the bank to call her that evening. Did you get everything okay? Bank call, said the car was overdrawn. Oh, it's all sorted. I'm just unloading now. There was a lot of financial evidence suggesting that the Garbutts were, did have money problems. Probably things weren't 100% in the shop financially because when you're in business, you do notice things. I knew that stock was being depreciated in the shop. It seemed to me, though, that they weren't keeping the stock that the previous owners had kept. Robin had large credit card debts. There was a suggestion from the prosecution that, that Robin had been living or spending beyond their means. I really think we should update the kitchen, don't you? You know we can't afford it. Oh, come on. What costs that much? You can't afford it. Robin? It was suggested by the prosecution that, that Robin was, was desperate to give his wife a certain lifestyle and was prepared to go into debt uh, to fund that lifestyle. 
You want to watch yourself in Vegas, all those casinos. I can't wait. Three whole weeks. Um, and th they suggested that this was one of the contributing factors that they claimed tipped bopping over the edge that, that, that day. Throughout the trial, the prosecution painted a picture of Robin as a husband who was spending beyond his means um, to, to keep his wife. She perhaps didn't want to be in a relationship anymore. She was looking for out, and yet he was desperate to keep her, and he was prepared to spend considerable amounts of money to do that. The suggestion was that on the, the night the murder took place. Diana was potentially packing to, to leave. The suggestion of the prosecution was that, that Robin wanted to stop that, and, and it's then that he did what he did. The prosecution's version of events is that Robin had, had killed Diana sometime during the night and had then opened the shop as normal, gone about his business as normal. All right, take care. And had then feigned the, uh, the appearance of the gunman at about half past eight. The robbery and murder had happened almost exactly a year after the first incident raising further suspicion as to whether the first robbery had in fact been faked by Robin in order to steal from the post office to cover his rising debts. It's the post office in Melson. We've been robbed. The whole police case in summary was that, that Robin's story was, was too far-fetched to be believed. Despite the prosecution's attempts to build the profile of a killer husband, the forensic evidence against Robin was deeply flawed. Diana was found on her bed when, when Robin and, and the neighbour found her. Now, Diana had been in the army, she had worked uh, for a prison, she'd worked as a prison guard, so everybody assumes that had anything happened, she would have defended herself. Robin? Oh, my God! But the most astonishing thing is that there was a clump of hair there. She would have put up a struggle. And so had she, had she actually snatched some hair out of her assailant's um, head, absolutely perfect evidence. There's no association of Robin with the clump of hair because his hair... Uh, his hair was grey and, and short, and this hair was longer. And because it's on the scene of crime photographs that were, that were taken, and what happened to it, the police lost it. The, the defence team made a number of suggestions that North Yorkshire Police's investigation um, wasn't completely competent and, and professional as it could have been was the single most important piece of evidence and all the police could say was, well, we've lost it.
listening to, the, to that 999 call in court, it was a, a dramatic moment. Were well, any weapons involved or men, sir? I think the, uh, the guy with me, um, he had a gun and he said to me... He like, had a uh, gun, sir. The guy who came with me said he had a, well, he did have a gun and he said, don't be stupid, um, we've got your wife. There was no doubt in my mind that, that Robin was extremely upset on making the call. Ambulance, what's the address of the emergency? I guess the question is what was making him upset. Was it because he just found his wife who'd, who'd been uh, murdered by a, a robber? Or was it because he just murdered his wife? I don't believe there was one single piece of, of damning evidence throughout the trial. There was no smoking gun. What made Robin's story more unlikely was, was the sheer number of people who were in that village at the time, in, including, for example, a, a large number of school children who waited outside the shop, many with, with, with parents. And they, they never saw anything. There was nothing. Uh, I didn't hear anything. And as I say, I was outside and I was only sort of what is it, 50, 70 yards from the actual shop. The whole police case in summary was that it was just a lie that Robin was telling. After less than five hours of deliberation, the jury returned their verdict. Total disbelief when it came, and, and what did surprise me uh, more than anything was this, the speed in which they the came to the, the decision. Just sheer disbelief that, you know, they could finding guilty with all the evidence that had been put before them. Robin just hung his head. You only needed to see the look on Robin's face throughout the trial, let alone on the day, to understand that this man did not do it. This man's not capable of doing it. And we will fight to the end 